Welcome. Welcome to the man room. To the man room. Welcome to the man room. What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Man Room. I am your host, Marcus Bridges. Thank you so much for joining me today. Super excited about today's podcast. Real quick, let's take care of some homework. Of course, you can find us on everything you see on the screen, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We're on Google. We're on Facebook, uh, Stitcher. Look, if you're looking for podcasts, you can find us. That's the tall and the short of it. Uh, You can donate to the page over at uh, themanroompodcast.com. We put everything right back into the podcast there. You can also join us on Patreon. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. My guest today is an author of a book that just dropped. It is called The Safety Trap, a security expert's secrets for staying safe in a dangerous world. And as much as I hate to admit it, I am a little bit of a paranoid safety nerd. So I am so excited to talk to the author today, uh, Mr. Spencer Corson. Thank you so much for joining me on the Man Room Podcast. Marcus, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. No problem. Now, you are, uh, as it says right here on the cover of the book, you are a security expert. And I know that uh, as far as walks of life are concerned there, you've really run the gamut for security. Um, Can you give us a little bit of a background on both your military experience and your security experience? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, after college, I joined the Army after doing an internship with the Justice Department because I wanted to go work for the Secret Service or the FBI or something along those lines. And they told me that the best best step for me to, uh, you know, to move forward would be to go into the military because that would give me like the three years post-collegiate experience I need, weapons and tactics training would help with the security clearance. And in 1999, there was really nothing going on in the world. So I got to go to like airborne school and ranger school and really get myself trained up. Uh, Of course, then September 11th happened. Uh, deployed overseas, got out of the army and went to work for uh, the government doing diplomatic security work, in which case I did about 300 protective missions to 163 different countries. Wow. Traveling the world, just, you know, helping to keep, you know, uh, dignitaries and and VIPs safe. And then I went to work for a, a company out in Los Angeles, which at the time was considered to be like the secret service for the private sector. Did that for a number of years, got the opportunity to go overseas and work on the movie Zero Dark Thirty. And um, came back and was and was doing, you know, helping good people to make bad things better when the tragedy at Sandy Hook happened. And, you know, both of my parents were teachers and I had family and friends who still teach. And that was kind of when I made the pivot to uh, to starting my own firm so that I could take that skill set that I had applied or that was being employed by, you know, these you know, the top 1% of the world and make those that skill set readily available for the other 99%. Because while not everyone will know the luxury of having their own security detail, I firmly believe that everyone deserves to be protected. And so the book is simply an extension of that of that philosophy. Yes, absolutely. And and I I like it because you use these real world examples like 9-11 and and some school shootings and and the like to set up your chapters. And it's not a heavy read in that, um, you know, it's really uh, pulls on the heartstrings as much as you use it as a practical example to say, listen, all things considered. If we would have done X instead of Y, we might have changed this situation. And I love the way that you set up those examples. Um, can you talk to me just a little bit about the safety trap? I love the title of the book. I know you kind Thank of you. build the whole thing around it. What is a safety trap? Yeah, so the safety trap is a turn of phrase I coined a few years ago to help my clients to better understand the false sense of security that sometimes occurs when our fears have abated, but risk remains. Another way of saying it is sometimes feeling safe is the most dangerous thing we do because when our vigilance goes down, our risk goes up. And when that is allowed to happen, we are much more susceptible to falling into those quote unquote safety traps. And I've outlined a bunch of them in in the book. And I, I really appreciate you saying that it wasn't like this wasn't intended to be like a fear mongering book. But what I wanted to do was, you know, basically, look, here's the very world, the very real world circumstances that everyone from, you know, the everyday school teacher to the CEO of a global organization kind of gets themselves into. And the more we are aware of the realistic risks we are most likely to face, the better prepared we can be to keep that risk from ever becoming a reality. And so I structured the book in such a way. I was like, look, here's what happened. Here's how it was allowed to happen. And here's five things that you can do to keep that from happening to you. 
because ultimately what I wanted this to be was a, you know, a come for the story, but stay for the lesson type of a resource guide on how to live your very best life the safest way possible. And it really does a great job of that. Um, you know, I, I was finding myself relaying it to personal stories that I have as I read through it. And I'll be 100% honest with you, Spencer. I have a very vanilla lifestyle as far as security. Nothing's really threatened me, fortunately. I feel very lucky in that. Um, I, I haven't been in, you know, the the big 20-person bar fights. I, I've always seemed to be on the periphery of these things, watching them happen. So I really enjoyed reading the book because I thought, well, you know, maybe there isn't something I can do. Maybe there is, but I feel more prepared to make that decision after reading the book. And um, yeah, you know, that's great. I mean, I think our willingness to participate in our own protection is probably the number one takeaway. I hope at, you know everyone would you know extrapolate from this book. It's just that you know we no longer live in a world where we can simply hope that the first responders will save us when something bad happens. Like everyday safety requires the participation of everyone, and the more that we have a willingness to participate in that process, the more we can ensure the certainty of safety for everyone involved. Sure. Uh, you know, a little personal anecdote that came up and it's going to, it'll probably make you laugh because it's so far away from the real world stuff that you, you work with every day. But um, I'm an avid golfer and I never used to really flinch or even duck and cover or anything. When somebody would yell for, I would just kind of go about my day until the day I got hit by a golf ball on the fly. And now if somebody says they got a four too loud while they're writing the score on their scorecard, I'll duck and cover because it hurts so bad that I never wanted to have to go through it again. And it changed something in me psychologically that one second. Just, just frame of reference, you didn't have to be on a course in Las Vegas, did you? <laughs> no, I wish. I was on a okay. municipal because course in Eugene. Very, <laughs> very similar circumstance. Where I'm out golfing with a with a ranger buddy of mine and his dad. They, they We do this golf trip every year. And my buddy is, he's like uh, Billy Madison. He can just drive that ball like 500 yards. So the people up on the tee in front of us like think that they're, you know, in safe playing field. And my buddy just drills it. And we're like, four. And it just pelts this guy like right in the neck. And he's oh, like, no. thinks he's fine. And then like we see him later and he's got like this welt. And his dad was like, I'm never ignoring a four again. Yeah, it's it's true. And it. I, I mean, when I say it psychologically changed me, I have a flinch mechanism now in my body that goes off when I hear four. And the other thing that I do is it's made it more enjoyable. You do not understand the amount of people that look to the sky when somebody yells four as if they're going to spot that little white ball plummeting out of, uh, out of uh, you know, out of from velocity or uh, with velocity. So. Uh, yeah, right. It's just, almost like if you hear four, your first response should be this. Yeah, that's what mine is. I, I, I look like somebody is attacking. I really do. So um, that brings me to my next point of uh, your chapter in your book on inattentional blindness is something that yes. we almost kind of, you know, I went along my daily world on the golf course playing two, three times a week without ever caring because I had never been in a situation where it, it even got close enough to me to really concern me. And so I saw myself after reading your book saying, man, I have inattentional blindness there for like most of my golfing career. Well, not just like in our golfing career, but it's like kind of one of those things where, you know, we don't stub our toe on the things we notice. We stub our toe on the things we don't. Yes. But it's not like the Lego on the floor was like hiding in wait to ambush us as we like went to get our morning coffee. It was <laughs> always there. We just weren't expecting to see it. Therefore, we didn't see it. And now we've got a pain in our foot. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that my global experience has proven like time and time and time again, is that when we don't expect to see danger, we simply fail to see the warning signs that something bad is about to happen. But the warning signs are always there. And staying safe is about, you know, training ourselves to see them. And so the more that we can adopt that awareness plus preparation equals safety, you know, mindset, the better we can all be in our, you know, everyday lives. Sure. What are some, uh, uh, you know, kind of glaring examples of inattentional blindness that you're used to seeing uh, in, in people or maybe your clients? So the, the number one is car accidents. Is peep, the number most people get into car accidents within one mile of their home because they don't like the back of their hand. And so they start either thinking back to what they were going to, what they just did, or they're projecting ahead to what they're going to be doing. And that transitional zone, one mile from our house, is like 
I think it's like something like 85% of, of car accidents that happen within a one mile radius of their home. They're not even hitting another car. They're hitting a parked car. That's not typically there wow. because they, they take the corner too soon or they take it too wide or, or what have you. And so one of the things I talk about in the book is like, just like changing up your routine. And I'm not saying that you have to change up your routine because, you know, you're involved in some like industrial espionage, MI5, James Bond, Ethan Hunt type existence. But one, it just, it keeps those neurotransmitters firing. It keeps you from falling into that, that complacency, which is another chapter in the book. And then to the extent that someone may be stalking you or following you or, you know, trying to get your routine down, just adding that extra layer, layer of unpredictability could be the difference between them targeting you and targeting someone else. So like I said, the more we can just be aware of the realistic risks that are out there, the better we can, the better prepared we can be, because most of us are never going to be in a terror concern or a kidnap exploit or an active shooter or, or a plane crash or you know any of these like fascinating or not fascinating but you know tragic occurrences that we see on the news. But most of us may be in a in a business negotiation where being too polite will work to our disadvantage rather than our, our advantage, or you know our. We think that if, you know, just because we do a, a 30 minute Peloton, you know, twice a week, that if something did happen, we'd be able to sprint down a hallway. So just, you know, it's a, all about just like properly framing the expectation so that our understanding can give us the best information possible so that we make decisions that improve our survivability rather than those more aligned with being a victim. Gotcha. And, you know, it's that that inattentional blindness that you talk about in driving. I can't count the number of times that I've looked up and I'm, you know, a few blocks away from my house. And I went, all right. I How have did a, I get here? Yeah, yeah, I have a vivid memory of checking for wallet, watch, and keys and, and everything before I left the house. But there is a 15 to 25 second blind spot from when I pulled out of my house to where I pulled onto that main thoroughfare. And to me, I, I'm always, ever since I moved into a neighborhood, I just, even though I'm not a dad, I got the instant dad instincts where I come into mm -hmm. my neighborhood and I slow way down because of kids and dogs and all the rest of it. And so I know I right. was cruising at a good speed through the neighborhood, but I don't know where I was the six inches between my ears because it's just in the ether somewhere. And that is probably where I'm most likely to hit a parked car. I mean, it, you, you yeah. give a perfect what, and, example. And not only that, man, but it's one of those things where one of the safety traps that we sometimes fall into is that we expect everyone else to behave like we would. And so, you know, there's like a tenant in leadership where it's like you have to anticipate the needs of others. Right. Like sometimes staying safe is about like anticipating the idiocy of others. Like, is that guy going to like just cut in front of me without turning his blinker on? You know, so it's, it's or is that kid just going to run out into the street because he's more worried about his skateboard than he is about the car that's coming down the street? So, so much of it is just like putting yourself in, you know, just getting outside of our own lane and seeing it from like a, a bigger vantage point. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I tried to, you know, show in the book, like, hey, listen, just because this happened to this person, you may not be in a, um, like in a sexual harassment, you know, situation, but you might be in a, in a, you know, in a cafe where something doesn't look right and you shouldn't, you know, your willingness to defend yourself should always be greater than your unwillingness to offend another. And just being cognizant of, of those, you know, variables that are constantly interplaying in our everyday lives can really help you to make more informed decisions. Sure. I, I feel that on, on such a personal level because my entire life, I've, I've kind of lived by this philosophy that in general, I don't want to make a dent in anyone else's day. I'm not the guy that, you know, I, I'll, I'll wait in line patiently. I'll open doors and stuff like that. I don't uh, raise hell if something's not right at a restaurant or if they don't have what I want at the store. But your book, when I was reading through it, really kind of did, it, it shook me by the shoulders a little bit and saying, look, it's good to be polite. It's good to be courteous and it's good to be a good person. But at the end of the day, all of that added up and put in a bag is not going to give you any sense of security uh, for anybody other than everybody else. And I, I really, I felt that, like I said, kind of right in my chest, like, okay, you can be nice, but you got to be a little bit more aware, you know, head on a swivel type stuff, uh, right. you know, identify things that might be in your surroundings that could be, I don't know, suspicious, you know, a little bit volatile, if you will. Right. And it's not just noticing them, but not not negotiating against them right it, like it, sometimes you'll be in a situation and we have a tendency to sometimes play 
uh, defense attorney for the other party that we think might be a threat to us rather than judge in our own decision making. Got it. So if you're going to be like, well, like I had a friend who was in a in a hotel in New York and she went downstairs to have a, a cigarette and a, and a cup of coffee. And this guy came downstairs and he looked a little dodgy and he was kind of like fidgety and he was by himself and everyone else was, you know, in, in gate, like ordering something. And he was just kind of like looking around everyone around. And she kind of went, well, you know, like he's a little dodgy and he's a little fidgety. He's like, but, you know, the hotel rates are a little lower and he's probably just making sure he has his room key. Like did all of the defense work for his case, but didn't do any of the defense work for her case. And then like looked down and away from him. And next thing she knew, this guy was throwing his arm into her shoulder, stealing her purse and running away because he basically surveyed who, you know, regardless of circumstance or scenario, number one factor of target selection is likelihood of success. And she was being too polite and taking her eyes off him and giving him the benefit of the doubt instead of just maybe not staring him down, but looking past him and looking that, you know, just being aware of his movements and his interactions so that, you know, perhaps he would have either decided that it, the, you know, the risk wasn't worth the reward or would have targeted someone else. And she could have been in a better position to call for help or get a first responder or, or you know, scream for help or, or what have you. But, you know, bad guys are a lot like lion stalking gazelles in the wild. They don't go after the strongest of the herd. They go after the weakest. Right. And when you see someone who's afraid to look at you, but who's also a smoker, that guy's thinking, okay, she's she's not going to want to look at me. Smoking in this day and age means disposable income. Disposable income means she probably has nicer stuff. I'm going to steal her purse rather than the person that's just sitting alone. And that brings me to, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here because I've got some stuff on your, on the next chapter avoidance behaviors and everything. But what Mm -hmm. you just said brings me to something that you said about evacuation uh, routes. And I also want to relate that and see what you think about um, evacuation routes. You said in the book that basically if I'm, if I want to think like a criminal, find the evacuation route and know that you've got basically uh, money in the bag right there. And, and I've always felt the same way about gun-free zones. I wanted to see what your thoughts were about gun-free zones uh, when they're established in certain places that almost kind of just make ready-made soft targets for people if they wanted to go and do terrible things in those areas. Is there a parallel between those two ideas there, gun-free zones, evacuation routes that are online and everything in your mind? Yeah, so a gun-free zone, so a gun-free zone is, is, you know how like they say like locks keep out the honest people? Yes. Gun-free zones are keep the law-abiding people from carrying weapons. Right. But they do nothing to deter the criminals because the criminals probably shouldn't have a weapon in the first place. And if they're already willing to commit one crime, what's going to stop them from committing another crime? And so, yeah, I mean, listen, the, our country needs to just have like a total oh, – don't get me wrong. I'm a veteran. I carry a gun. I have a concealed carry permit. I am – always armed when legally allowed to do so. Mm -hmm. But I'm also like a proficient shooter. I put probably a thousand rounds down range a month. I'm a combat veteran. I am well-skilled in in the application of violence and my weapon hides behind me, not I don't hide behind my weapon. Right. But there's, you know, there's, there is something to be said about mindset. So if you're in a gun-free zone, like I hope that you live in an area that also has almost near immediate police response time. I also hope that you're being more vigilant and aware of your surroundings because, you know, like New York City is a gun free zone. Are you telling me there's no violent crime in New York City? (laughs) Like it's it's it. I mean, that is its own safety trap. Right. Exactly. And it's the safety trap of expectation. It's the safety trap. Oh, well, if, if the law here is that there's no guns, then there's no guns. Well, that's just not the case. Right. It's just not the case. Yes. And when it comes to like, you know, these evacuation routes or. You know, don't go to where it's clearly identified that this is the evacuation point because you just told, you know, buildings, offices, schools, they're all these like intercompartmented pockets of their own protection. And if you give that up to come to one centralized location, what was the point? If something is so bad that the building needs to be evacuated, just go as far away from that threat as possible. Go to Starbucks, go to the coffee shop, go home. Like survivability is not accountability. And, you know, when we when we have and also like you can just go on social media and just like do like a hashtag fire drill and see where all of these known locations are. So 
it might be very difficult for me to get a bomb into a building, but it's very easy for me to get it into the parking lot outside where I know everyone's going to gather. And if all I have to do is just call in a bomb threat to get everyone outside, you know, like literally that's more bang for your buck if you're a bad guy. Yeah, exactly. And and it's why I've, I've kind of always, well, there's one thing that I see with a lot of videos when you're watching security footage or maybe you see a viral video of, of something tragic that's happening, some type of, uh, you know, incident. Um, one thing that there's always kind of common in these is like right as the video opens, a lot of times you'll see a guy on a dead sprint. And you don't know where he's going, but due east and fast. And that, to me, I always look at that guy and I think, that guy's seen some shit and he doesn't want to see any more. So he's right. he's out of here. And people laugh at that guy. It's a little bit comical to see as the video opens up right before tragedy strikes. But that guy's actually one of the smartest dudes in the area right there. 100%. Because he's just going for higher ground. He doesn't care where, just away from the threat. He's putting as much time and distance between him and the threat as possible. I mean, one of the things that I I really rally pretty hard in the book is just like the near stupidity of run, hide, fight, because the original intention of run, hide, fight, which is great if you're an individual or if you're a POW who is, you know, caught overseas and you need to, because I mean, run, hide, fight was basically extrapolated from escape, evade, retaliate. Mm -hmm. So if you're caught, if you're taken prisoner, you're going to break free. If you're going to try to get as far away from them and try to get to the next friendly forces as possible. If you're too tired to keep running, you're going to hide and camouflage yourself until you can get your energy back. Then you're going to keep running. And then if the enemy should should catch or capture you again, you're going to fight like your life depends on because it does. Yeah. And then this whole like cottage industry popped up with like schools and workplaces and, and run, hide, fight basically just got it became run to your hiding spot. And that's, you know, a, a, a fire in a building is just as dangerous and unpredictable as an active shooter. But we would never hide from a fire and hope it doesn't find us. Exactly. Like we would we would run. We would put as much time and distance between that threat as possible. Yeah. Because just like and here's the other thing is that the the real issue with with school and workplace violence is that most often those are insider threats, not outside actors. So they're participating in those very same active shooter drills. So they know exactly what their intended victims are going to be doing. So that insight really only makes their attack plan more effective. Right. So what are we doing? Like, <laughs> which would you rather be? The kid like cowering in the corner or the one who's putting time and distance between them and the threat with each step they take? Yep. Yep. And, and you know, you touch on uh, something that, you know, we don't have to expand on too much here because I think it's a universal truth. Physical fitness is important. And if you want to take an active role in your own in your own personal security, you should think about that fit, uh, physical fitness part because you might have to run for a few hundred yards. Once you get to the end of it, though, you might be short of breath, but you're not going to have a hole in your chest. Right. I mean, not only that, but you when mo- when when your life is on the line, you want to be the one who is forever grateful that you did your workout not the one who forever wishes they had. And not only that, but the, and not just the having the, the confidence and of knowing that you can perform under pressure, but also our bodies biologically are meant to exert energy. And if that energy isn't being displaced either through a workout or some other kind of like vigorous exercise, that energy really only has one other place to go. And it's typically like anxiety or depression. And right. because, you know, we're just so lethargic and we're not under undervaluing ourselves. And so the more that even if it's just a walk around the block or a couple push ups a day or just anything you can do to just keep your, you know, movement as vida, like movement is life because you're either going to need to protect your own life. You're going to need to protect someone else or you're going to, you know, need to do something that can help get you from point A to point B because you talk to any soldier in combat ever and it's like you know, shoot, move, communicate, do something because the worst thing you can do is nothing. Sure. But you have to have the confidence in your ability to do that thing in order for your, your body to follow what the mind wants it to do. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, you know, uh, you, you recommend uh, power through pushups is one of the things. And, and you know, I've been ever since I started reading this, I've been just if I have a few minutes, I'm just sitting there and I'm about to grab Facebook or something on my phone. I just knock out 10 or 15 pushups really quick. And, yeah. I, you know, I don't know if it's going to make me better on the golf course or, 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 you know, cut down on my mile time, which I haven't measured in years. But what I do know is that it's 10 more of them that I didn't do or 15 more of them that I wouldn't have done before I started this. And I really I have to credit the book because 
I feel like the opportunities to advance your physical fitness are a lot more plentiful during the day than what a lot of people give them credit for. You don't need an hour. You don't need, sometimes you need five minutes and that's it. You if, know? If, and look at man, like, let's say that you can do, you could drop down right now and all you can do is 10 pushups, right? But then if you do 10 pushups today, you're going to be sore for the next three days to do. So now you're, you know, now you're going to wait till the next week to do 10 pushups. But what if you just did three pushups every day, for seven days, well, now you're at 21 push-ups. So per volume, you've just doubled what you would normally do if you only did it one day. And then maybe the next week you can go up to like four a day or five a day, whatever. Like something is better than nothing. Yep. But like it is much better to do a little bit every day than a lot of something once. Yeah. And, and I so think- you know, the more you can get into that routine, the more you can get into that mindset, the more, and then it just becomes a passion. Like, oh, I like how I feel. I'm going to eat healthier. I'm going to work out. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a, it's an evolution. Like safety is a lot like fitness. Like you can have your gym membership, but if you don't work out, you're not going to get fit. Safety is not a safety is a lot the same way. It's not a destination. It's a, it's an ever expanding journey that requires our participation. That's, that's very point. I, I really like the way that you put that. And, um, you know, without, like I said, without getting too deep in the physical fitness thing, I've always kind of tried to live by this adage that it's, it's like your car. If you took your car into the dealership, they're going to look at it as a Chevy Silverado 1500 that was manufactured in 2014 with a 5.7 liter engine, right? They're right. not going to go, well, this is a car and so is a Porsche, so let's service this like we're going to service a Porsche. Think about your physical fitness in the same fashion. If you are a 350-pound a, a dude just trying to start out, three push-ups is a great way to start. And as you continue that journey, you're going to build, but you're going to do it it based around what you are as a person, not what somebody else on YouTube thinks that the model of a person that's starting their workout should be. Listen, and I will take that. I will use that exact same car metaphor and extrapolate that to security plans. You know, your, your, your school says, oh, no, we have a security plan. And, you know, or your workplace says, oh, no, we have a security plan. Well, you know, there's a wide divide between like the bouncer in the bar and the secret service that protects the president. So understanding what, like I was working on a, on a, on a, uh, uh, gave an interview for a news magazine because there was a celebrity that was being stalked and, you know, the guy wound up in her pool and she's like, well, I don't understand how this happened if they had security. I was like, well, what do you mean by security? Because like just having a car is, you know, there's a big difference between a Honda and a Maybach. Right. There's also a big difference between a bouncer and a bar and the secret service. So don't always be so, placated by being told that security is present like really ask that next question of what that security is because you know you see the cameras and the you know the domes and the security guard at target well, those those cameras aren't there for you they're to protect the products you right. know so when you see security systems or what have you kind of treat that like a bodyguard walking next to a celebrity like just because security is present doesn't mean that security is there for you got it that's a great and, and that kind of uh, speaks a little bit to your chapter on false authority, which I yes. absolutely loved. Um, I am a season ticket holder at Autzen Stadium for the Oregon Ducks. I'm, an, I'm a University of Oregon alumni, and I have over the last decade made uh, just kind of a little enjoyable habit where I just watch the blue coat security, and that's what we've called them for years. You referred to them as yellow coats in in, uh, yeah, the I think they're track. different in, in all over the place. It's the same right. guy. It's the same guy everywhere we are. And uh, I thought it was interesting because I have seen a lot of these quote security personnel that are unarmed and they're they're all over the stadium. I've seen them a couple of times get involved beyond their own authority. And and in the book a lot, you talk about how the the individual will look to them and see authority because of the jacket. But really, this is a minimum wage employee. They're there as more of a customer service agent than they are a security agent. Yes. Um. What can you What can you tell me about like an inflated sense of authority with some security guards, if you will? And is it does it affect uh, the individual because the security guard has the inflated sense of authority, or have I just in my life? always seen security and looked up to it as that person's there to protect me. And so I formed a bad habit. Both. Both. One is that someone who's working security at an event dreams of being in charge of all security for everything. Right. Like, and you, you see this with like, like soldiers who just got a basic 
basic training want to be a Navy SEAL. Right. Or they want to be an Army Ranger. Or they want to be in Delta Force. But really, all they learned was how, you know, the, the dangerous side, the dangerous end of a rifle. Mm-hmm. But when but if you hear that person, like, go back home and, like, talk to their friends, you would think they were like John Rambo. Right. <laughs> right. And so people will. Oh, no, he's like he, this guy's like a, a you know, a, a tough guy soldier. Like we should definitely take his his word for these things. But there, he has no real authority in in that realm beyond, you know, knowing how to march in a formation and, you know, load a load a rifle. Yeah. And so they project authority more than they have. And because we don't know any better, we assume that what they're saying is true. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's kind of like, you know, listen, my, my financial planner is like great with like stocks and mutual funds, but he's an idiot with Bitcoin. So I'm not <laughs> going to go to him for, you know, for, for, you know, how to, how do I, you know, turn my book into an NFT? Right. <laughs> I'm going to go to someone who like understands that. So just as like, you know, I'm not going to go to my, me- I'm going to go to my mechanic for my truck that needs new brakes, but I'm not going to ask him like, you know, how does he get his, his eggs so fluffy in an omelet? Like you have to. <laughs> You know, you have to really, I don't want to say like know the lane, but yeah. also like have a healthy sense of skepticism and in a moderate dose of vigilance in like, okay, well, like don't be afraid to get a second opinion. Sure. And don't think listen, the guy who is going to be responsible for, like if we're going to use that stadium uh, example, the guy who's going to be in charge of of uh, like the mass casualty evacuation plan for a, for a stadium with 50,000 people is also not going to be the guy tearing your ticket and telling you where your seat is. Right, right. So, if you're looking for a hot dog, talk to the blue coats. You want to know where the bathroom is? (laughs) You want to know where the 300 level is? That's your guy. Yeah, and Um, and you need to know where, like, you know what what the you know what the maximum effective range is of a particular weapon system. Probably not your guy. Probably not your guy. And and I will say to people, if you join me at Autzen Stadium or any other big football venue, basketball. Uh, baseball, there's typically uniformed police officers at these places too. And if you have a real security mm-hmm. concern, those are the people you want to seek out. And and look, if you have to get a yellow coat or a blue coat to take you to that guy, fine. But, right, yeah, uh, they're they're great. The, the, you everyone should see them not as security, but as like security liaisons. Yeah, like they're they're not. They can get you in touch with the people you need. They're security adjacent. But they're not the person you need. Yeah, they're security adjacent is the way I like to look at it, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I and I almost like wish that they wouldn't put like security on the jackets. Right. You know what I mean? Like I wish you would put like support staff or, you know, customer service or something to more properly frame the expectation of that job. But here's the problem. No one wants that job. Yeah. But if they can say, oh, I'm working security at the, at the football game this weekend. It makes them sound more posturous which it's amazing to me that we would sacrifice the feeling of the the 50,000 people so that the minimum wage employee can feel a little bit better about the shirt that they put on i and i, but, I don't mean to condescend to anybody in that no but no not at all I but feel isn't like, that yeah it, 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 it fuels my it, i'm sorry but it fuels my uh, appeal to that false authority because i see the word security and it's the first thing it's an instinct it's not something that i've done consciously right. it's something that my body has just come a keen to i trust that guy he's got security written yeah but isn't that isn't that an interesting like how how few people can or i wonder how many people if you pulled like 100 people how many people could tell you the difference between safety and security probably not many right because safety is a feeling yes i feel safe security is a state of being right it's so if you were to like think of like an umbrella and you open the canopy and it's starting to rain the security is the canopy that's like protecting you from the rain, keeping you warm and dry. Feeling safe is is being underneath, knowing that the canopy is going to work effectively, right? So, like a, a small child, like held by their mother, feels safe, but a mother's love alone is not enough to keep them secure from the evils of the world. Conversely, a small child tucked into their bed at night may be secure, but may not feel safe if they think there's a monster in the closet. Right. So in order for us to be truly protected, we need to both feel safe and be secured. And so much of our anxiety sometimes comes, you know, or I would even like, I think one of the reasons anxiety over our inability to keep ourselves and our loved ones protected, one of the reasons is that that anxiety is at an all time high is because our understanding of what it means to be protected is at an all time low. 
because we think that when we're safe, we're secure. And sometimes when we're secure, we don't feel safe. But really, those two things have to be in Congress in order for us to truly be protected. Because going back to that umbrella, it's going to work, that umbrella will work fine in a light drizzle or you know a moderate rain. But to expect that umbrella to perform the same with the same level of effectiveness like in a hurricane would be foolish. Right. But if we don't understand the threshold of that umbrella, we may falsely you know go out thinking that's going to perform one way when it's actually going to do more harm than good. Sure. Uh, you're a master at segues. It's like you're reading my notes right here because I, I also have written down here that I wanted to talk about avoidance behaviors and anxiety is something that you talk about in the chapter, um, lending itself yeah. to uh, kind of extrapolating avoidance behaviors across all, uh, you know, all experiences that you'll have. And I wanted to ask, it's something I wrote down right when I was reading that because I'm not an overly anxious person. I have tendency to get a um, little bit of, anxiety I do some stand-up comedy and and right the three minutes before I go on stage man the heart flutters and I've been doing right. stage stuff since I was a since I was in junior high 20 some odd years now I've been in front of crowds and people and for some reason I can't shake that little bit but I was wondering when I was reading the book in context of the book does the presence of avoidance behaviors actually serve to fuel our inherent anxiety whereas we're kind of in a almost a revolving door of I'm anxious, I'm going to avoid it. I'm anxious, I'm going to avoid it. Uh, um, and then really the end of it just says, like, I'm simply anxious because I'm too anxious to deal with a warning sign. Okay, no. So you're not too anxious. to If, you are, if you're too anxious to deal with a warning sign, then your anxiety has led it. Okay, let me, let me, let me back up. Okay. When you go on, when you're about to go on stage and you get those, those butterflies and, you know, your, your palms start sweat and you, you know, you're like, oh, I got to run to the bathroom real quick. And then you go up on stage when you're up on like you want those. That's that's your body like preparing you for performance. OK. Right. That's you making sure that like you got everything you, you're prepared, you know, you know, your segues, you know, your jokes. But if you didn't, if you weren't prepared, then you would then it would be anxiety. Because you're like, oh, uh, I can't do that. And then you would start getting into avoidance behaviors. Oh, I'm going to call in sick. Oh, I'm sorry. I had an emergency in the family. I can't do my set tonight. And then the more you, the more that anxiety grows, then you start getting into you. you start avoiding it more and more and more because you don't want to ever have to experience that anxiety again. And then that starts leading into depression and that, and then it's, it's this like devastating decrescendo of like really bad decision-making. Mm -hmm. So when that comes to safety, like none of us, no, no one fears that which they know well. So there's a difference between being a little bit afraid of something and being fearful. Because when we're afraid of something, we're prepared how to handle it, right? So if, when you're going up on stage, you're like you're a little bit afraid, you're a little bit anxious, but you know when you get up on stage, like, hey, I'm hit my groove. I, I've got, I've, I've hooked, you know, I've, I've synced with the audience, and now we're on a ride, and everything's going great. And you come off that stage elated. Oh yeah. A feeling right? like I've I can't compare it to any other feeling in the world, to be honest. I feel I give speeches all the time, and I like my, literally my leg will start to shake <laughs> before I go up on stage. But then once, but once I take the stage and the spotlight hits in the audience, I'm like, now I'm in my zone. Yeah, right. But you're like, oh wow, like he gets stage fright. I'm like, yeah, and I hope I never stop getting stage fright because that's how I know that I'm doing well. Sure. But sure. so, like when we're driving our car. Like we're always we're we're always a little bit afraid because was that that guy who's zooming up behind me? I'm gonna get out of his way. You know, I'm I'm watching the mirrors and checking the speedometer. But being fearful is about being unprepared, and when we're afraid of things, well, I'm sorry, not afraid of things, but when we're fearful of things, we get more anxious, and because we're we don't know how to you know possibly deal with that situation. And then it grows into anxiety and then, you know, or av avoidance. And the more we avoid, the more the anxiety grows. And then it's like this, this horrible, this sliding scale. But like just, and which is why I talk about just exposing yourself just a little bit, like start slow, build strong. Like when we all go out to Ikea and come back with that dresser and we see like, you know, a thousand pieces on the floor and we see the instruction manual that looks like it's, you know, written in hieroglyphics. We're like, how am I ever going to do this? Like, that's anxiousness. But if you just never, if you just leave those pieces on the floor, that anxiousness is going to grow into avoidance. That avoidance is going to grow into anxiety and nothing's ever going to get done. Yeah. But if you just go, all right, step one, put this piece with this piece. Got it. Next, put this piece with this piece. Got it. 
Next thing you know, like, oh, I built a dresser. I feel empowered. I feel capable. That's another tool to add to my skill set for, you know, things that may come down the line. If I'm building something else, like, oh, yeah, I remember how these pieces go together. Like, everyday life is the exact same way, whether it be, like, how to deal like in a business negotiation or how, how to, you know, audit our own homes for security or, or which, which is another like classic example. Um, people are always like anxious about their own home security. So I go up to someone in a parking lot and I say like, Hey, is your home secure? They go, yeah, of course. Absolutely. And then I say, all right, well, let's say that there's a million dollars in a duffel bag of the upstairs bedroom. If you have, you have 10 minutes, if you can get in and out without anybody, you know, being, any wiser money's yours can you do it they go yes so what changed in that five seconds between the first question and the second well what changed was their mindset they went from one thinking of a homeowner who wanted to project a, a positive protective posture about their own security and then five seconds later they were thinking like a bad guy right. so now they're thinking oh well you know the, the first floor doors are locked but you know we always keep the the deck on the second floor. So if I just jungle gym my way up there, I can get in or, you know, the downstairs bathroom window doesn't really shut. Right. So I could probably get in that way. Right. All those ways that you would break into your house are the exact same way that a bad guy would break in. So just being aware of those realities, you can put the safeguards in place to keep those realities from, you know, ever being realized or those risks from ever being realized. Like that's participating, but you don't have to be, anxious or have anxiety about home security, just do the, just start small. Like just think about, okay, if I had to break into my house, how would I do it? Right. And if you do that, like you're just going to improve your, your level of security, like astronomically, just by participating in your own protection. And you're further along in in realizing your abilities there than what you think, because everybody, you know, whether it be in high school, Absolutely. you're trying to sneak back into the house without mom and dad noticing. You're in college, you get four different roommates, you're constantly locked out of the house. I mean, look, we always had a way in, whether it was hopping a fence and coming in through a screen or, or any of that right, stuff. Like, how old were you when you realized that you could, like, pick a lock with a credit card? Uh, too young. I was, like, 10? <laughs> yeah, way too young. <laughs> And it's, yeah. it's one of those things that you don't understand how easy it is until you go click. Oh, wow. That's yeah. all that. Like took. I was like, we like, I was like, we, we like, uh, I don't know, like on vacation or something. And my uncle was like, Oh, I forgot my keys. And I just like pulled out his driver's license. Went, I was like, wow, wow. <laughs> that is some James Bond level spy craft. And I need to know how to do that. <laughs> That's great, man. Once again, reading from my notes, I actually have James Bond written down here because there's a, a part in your book, uh, once again, The Safety Trap, a security expert's secrets for staying safe in a dangerous world, available right now on Amazon, audiobook. You got to go pick this thing up. And I also want the listeners to know, I while I have notes on the entire book, I went ahead and pigeonholed it to about the first half because I want people to go out and buy the book and read it for themselves. I don't want to give it all away. There's so much good information, and we are literally skimming the fat off the top of the gravy after it's set for a little while with this podcast. So please go out and pick up Spencer's book, once again, The Safety Trap, available everywhere you can get books right now. Um, where I come to James Bond here, uh, I'll start it out by saying you quoted Edward Burke in saying the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And in your chapter on responsibility, um, I, I got to thinking that a lot of people today are hesitant because there's so many 4K cameras in everybody's pocket. And a lot of times a good Samaritan, I feel, might have a lot of hesitance to intervene and try to help in a situation where they're not involved because everybody's going to have it on film, not just one angle. They've got you from all over. You tell a story that is straight out of the James Bond handbook of smoothness at an airport where you intervened very calmly and coolly and collectively and totally diffused a guy. Can you give us the cliff notes of that real quick and then tell me um, what your advice would be to a good Samaritan that wants to help but is very, very uh, withdrawn because of all of the cameras and, and social media? Sure. So I'll, I'll give the cliff notes, but I think the one thing to take away is that not everyone is going to have the confidence or the skill set or, I mean, I'm 6'3", 220, and I can handle myself pretty well. So the likelihood of me being physically intimidated is low. Yeah. Now, I mean, I 
you know, the rock meets me in a dark alley and wants to hurt me, I'm probably at a tactical disadvantage and I'm going to run like hell. Right. But for most people, I can, I'm comfortable having an interpersonal exchange um, to do that. But what I want to say to most people is that if you see something, say something like you don't have to, to get involved, but like you, sometimes our willingness to help another is the first step to saving ourselves. And so what happened when, so whether that's, you know, someone who's acting out or someone who's, you know, emotionally distraught, like let's do what we can to help those individuals, especially in a post pandemic world where we cannot have our return to normalcy also come with a, a return to complacency because we, like I said, we need to participate in our own protection. But to your point about what happened in the airport, I was coming home for, from Christmas break and flights were delayed. And there was this guy who was just being a del- belligerent asshat to like the poor lady who was like working alone behind, I think it was like American Airlines. If it wasn't American Airlines, I apologize. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and she's being nice and polite and she's doing everything she can. But it's like, it's not her fault that, you know, snow delayed flights by like a couple hours. And so I had been there probably like six, seven hours at that point. And this guy was just, you know, bigger guy, but a little out of shape and just was, was being just belittling and berating. And there was like no security in sight. And I could, and she kept like backing away from the counter and I noticed that like no one was doing anything. So I just like very calmly walked up to the guy and was like, and as soon as I started walking up to you guy, to your point, everyone started taking out their cameras and like, and filming. Cause they were like, Oh, how's this going to go down? And I just basically used that reality to my advantage. I basically walked up to him and said, Hey, listen, I think, uh, you know, the, the best thing for you to do is leave right now because I just called security and you can say whatever you want. But if you look around, all of these people are filming us right now. And so do you want that to be exhibit a in this poor woman's uh, civil suit against you? Or do you want to walk away and find another flight without anyone, you know, being the wiser? And he just kind of like looked around and realize the reality of the situation and how bad that would look on social media for him. And he walked away and it still took like 10 minutes for, you know, for the security to show up. And the lady just kind of gave me like a nice thank you. And I walked back and everyone was like mostly disappointed because they didn't get to hear what I said to the guy or from it. So that didn't turn into anything, but yeah, I mean, sometimes our willingness to, you know, to help another is the first step to saving ourselves, because what if that guy had, gotten belligerent and had hurt that woman and then that delayed flights even longer and because now police have to come and investigate you know interview everyone you know who who was a possible witness and take everyone's credit like ids and photos and you're just making your life so much worse by all i had to really do is just walk up and just explain the reality of the situation to the guy and it immediately diffused the situation and probably got us out i mean uh faster than we otherwise would and the guy doesn't realize it because he's painfully embarrassed, I'm sure, but it helped him too. It really, it saved his day because his day was only going to keep getting worse if he kept standing at that counter yelling at that old lady. Right, right. And he was like, well, I'm never flying this airline again. And I was like, well, that's probably, good. you know, that's good. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what, that's winning. That's what winning looks like. Yeah. Thank you for playing. <laughs> Those of us that have worked in customer service at uh, any time in our life can tell you that when somebody says, at the end of an altercation like that, you just lost a customer. Everybody on the other end of the thing is saying, finally, now I don't have to deal with this person anymore. Good. <laughs> yeah. Now if I can just lose 50 more just like you, <laughs> right. this will be a great job. <laughs> no, but you know, right. it's like some like you don't need to go up and right on everything. What's the old uh, um, uh, uh, roadhouse, right? Be nice until it's time not to be nice. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> like, just be calm and collected. But like, obviously you know, present yourself in such a way that like, we're going to do this the easy way, but we're, I'm also okay doing it the hard way. Right. Easy way is going to be better for everyone. Yeah. Let's just do it the easy way. Oh, and, and I mean, I, I got to tip my cap to you because the smoothness, like I said, of that whole situation where you just used what was going on around you to your advantage to let this guy know that he was, he was at a tactical disadvantage, if you will, not to bastardize the term at all, but um, he was he was at a lot deeper hole than what he thought, and his only means uh, of of basically let having this go away and actually getting to fly again that day is to just walk away at that point. And you knew that going in, you you weren't thinking like 
you know, first, I know this and this, I'm going to use it to my advantage. Second, I'm going to deck him. Third, I've got him in a rear naked choke. No, you just knew, you had it in your mind that if you went up there and you let this guy know this is the reality of the situation, he's probably going to fold. Right, because he wasn't he wasn't trying to, like, get, I mean, he clearly had the capacity for violence because he was already, like, expressing words which alarm over actions that harm. Like, someone who says, like, I'm going to kill you, like, probably doesn't mean it because like i'm not going to tell you i'm going to punch you in the nose i'm just going to punch you in the nose right right um but also he was really just displacing his own grievance onto her and once i re- once he was able to realize that in doing so he was only going to make his own grievance much you know it was going to only escalate his own concern you're able to just like turn that mirror back on himself and he's like ah like all right i'm this was not the appropriate way for me to address this grievance let me you know find another outlet for my frustration yeah and you know i'd much rather him do that at a bar down the you know down the tarmac than you know in a prison cell where he's going to stew and then want retaliation or retribution against blah 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 sure so like i said sometimes our willingness to help another i i was doing that to help the poor woman behind the counter but you know aside uh, he certainly benefited from that intervention too yep um yeah just but like if you're not comfortable doing that you know, recording it would be great, but also just like call for help. Like if you don't start recording an altercation where someone is in danger until you've also like done your part to help them. Right. I think of it if if you've ever had first aid training, the very first thing that you do, call 911. You you yell it as loud as you can. You look somebody right in the eyes and you tell them to do that. Think of it as the same exact uh, line of of things that you should do. If you're going to record it, you should already have asked for help or tried to get help. Um, I, I have this just kind of this thing in my side about how the phones come out so instinctively now and our first, a lot of times the audience of whatever's going on, their first inclination isn't to help. It's to get it on film, which helps, but only in the aftermath, only trying to build the pieces back together. It doesn't solve yeah. the problem as it sits in front of you. There was uh George Clooney gave a, a great interview. I want to say it was with Mark Marin, maybe, or someone. And he was basically saying about when he got in that like really bad uh, motorcycle accident, how like no one was helping, but everyone was filming it. And he's like, oh, this is how I'm going to die. Like on, you know, TMZ on someone's cell phone footage, because everyone was so self self serving of their own, you know, social media sense of reality in, you know, so anxious for likes that they weren't willing to help our fellow, our fellow citizen. And one of the concerns I really have about us coming you know, back into, you know, the normalcy of our world is that we've become so reliant on these cyber ways of communicating that our interpersonal dynamics, I mean, those are perishable skills. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why when you see like people come out of like, like prison or solitaire, or even out of the military, they come back from combat, and they have to get re-socialized, because we get so used to you know, operating in one environment that, you know, there was that shooting, that poor six-year-old kid got killed in California, because the mom flipped someone the bird, which she had done probably a 100 times before. But this one person was, you know, was already so, you know, so upset and so frazzled that that was enough, you know, the threshold now is so low that even just doing something that ordinarily would just be a, 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 you know, a, simply dismissed, can now escalate into into violence. And so I, I think our society really needs to be cautious about how this reemergence and how how the aftershocks of a year in isolation and quarantine really impacts our interpersonal behaviors. Yeah, uh, it's crazy out there right now, man. I mean, there I feel like people are uh, much more thin skinned after a full year than what they used to be. And I don't know. Yeah. This, I don't know the psychological trappings of that. I don't know what causes it. What I can tell you is anecdotally. I've seen it everywhere <laughs> from the fast food line to the mm-hmm. store to the gas station. I mean, I, I almost feel like now going out to a crowded place, I'm more likely to see somebody get into some type of verbal altercation than I've ever been. And that includes the college days when everybody was just drunk running around like children. I still feel like it's more volatile now than it was back then, you know? Well, because we forget that, you know, my, like my dog is like, I mean, he's a, like a well-trained service dog, but if there's someone on the other side of the fence, he's like, rrr, rrr. but as soon as that fence is taken away, he's like, Hey buddy, what's up? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think we've gotten like so used to, you know, being able to say and act and behave in one way behind a computer screen 
that that pattern in practice, that condition response can sometimes bleed over into the interpersonal world. Mm -hmm. And it's two different dynamics. Yeah. And when the impersonal bleeds over to the personal and the threshold for that kind of behavior is so low, there's a very real likelihood that it could be met with um, an inappropriate level of uh, outrage. Right, right. Um, I don't have a whole lot more here. We're going to wrap this up real soon. But uh, you actually, you wrote something in your book that's something that I've tried to live by for, uh, during my professional career as a salesman. And that is, uh, you, you use the term, and I used to just absolutely pound on the desk during sales meetings, uh, under promise and over deliver. I imagine you know that to be a sales guy adage from the word go. Um, can you talk about that a little bit with respect to your chapter on expectations and expand on it a little bit? Sure. Um, so framing and managing expectations is, you know, the under promise of, the best, what's the a really great example of under promise over deliver? Uh, you go to a restaurant and uh, the host tells you, hey, it's going to be a 20 minute wait. Uh, you can go and have a seat at the bar. So you're like, all right, I'm, you know, I'm going to have maybe a drink. We'll get another one to go when the, when the table's ready. It's great. So you go over and sit down and five minutes later, they come over and be like, hey, your, your table's ready for you. You're like, oh, great. Like, thank you so much. I really appreciate the hustle. You know, you guys, you guys always take good care of us here. Thank you so much. Now, what if that person said, oh, your, your table will be ready in five minutes. Do you just want to like stand here for a second? And then 20 minutes later, you're still standing there. Right. And then they come back and like, uh, now they have to keep reframing your expectation. Oh, just another five minutes. Just another five minutes. Just another five minutes. Eventually, you're going to be like, you know what? I'm out of here. I'm going to go somewhere else. Someone who respects my time more. So the expectation game is huge. But that expectation is a, is a two-way street. It's you want to not only have your own expectations properly framed, but you want to make sure that your, I'm sorry, you don't want the expectations, you want to make sure that your expectations are being properly framed by others so that you can understand what to expect. But you also want to make sure that the expectations that you have set for yourself are also true because it's not what you don't know that often gets you into trouble. It's what you think you know for sure that just isn't so. Mm -hmm. So example, you know, you see all those cameras and you think that those cameras are there for you when really they're there to protect the products. I mean, just think of that in terms of like, is your ring camera at your front door there to protect you and your interests or is it there to protect the mailman? Right. Not there to protect the mailman. Right. <laughs> you know, it's there to protect you. Yeah. So why would you think that security cameras elsewhere are there to protect you? Because they're not. You know, I mean, the security cameras are there to protect the interests of those who installed them. Right. And when you extrapolate that to out into like our everyday lives, you know, hey, my kid's security plan, are, is that a, like, are those geared towards them keeping accountability of everyone or are they for the survivability of everyone? Like, remember uh, like stop, drop and roll? Like stop, drop and roll is not going to like, if you're on fire and you drop to the ground, you start rolling around, not going to put the flames out. No. But here's what it does do in a group setting. It, you know, identifies that you're on fire and allows other people to come to your aid. It also keeps you from running around and panicking and spreading that fire around to other places. Right. So understand the intent of, of, of that, of that, of that practice. Same thing with like, you know, the, the cold war kids were hard to kill hiding under their desks in an air raid drill, like being under your desk in an air raid is not going to save your life. But it, what it did do was give the schools a way to match your receding chart to the central office so they know who had died. So don't be afraid to participate in your own protection. Don't be afraid to ask the hard questions, but frame your own expectation as much as you possibly can so that you can, you know, be sure that you are making, be, you can be sure that you have the best information possible so that you can make the most informed decisions so that you can do what you need to do to ensure your own safety and the safety of your loved ones. That's great. It, that, that Cold War Kids example, you give that in the book. And I, you know, it's a real time that kind of caused chills to run down my spine a little bit because I had never thought about it in the context that they really were hoping that they were going to be able to match names with bodies there more than they thought that those deaths were going to protect them. Because I, I come from a, from a generation where 
it was like elementary school. We were hiding under desks, and then we got to you know a, a little bit more like evacuation, more like fire drill type stuff. But I'm mm-hmm. also a kid who never went through a school shooting drill. Thurston, uh, you know, the, the Thurston shooting uh, with Kip Kinkle. I had cousins that were at that school that were older than me that, that experienced that personally. And just right across the, the very same state that we lived in, we still never had any type of active shooter drills until long after I was out of high school. So it, it's always kind of been an eye opener. It's like there's there's reasons why these things get done. And a lot of times they're not the reasons that you just think that are common sense that pop into your head first. Like, right. the, like the Cold War, uh, the Cold War kids. So the book is chocked full of stuff like that. And I love it. The nine the nine uh, eleven example um, as as jarring as it is yes with the port authority um and that i believe is in the uh is in the false authority section of the book and yes it will i mean read it you guys because it's something that when i just told my wife about it i got done and i slammed that book down i "I have to tell you this and i totally just unloaded it on her and her eyes were as big around as dinner plates because that is that is something that we all lived through i mean very very pliable i think i was 15 during 9-11, I woke up, was getting ready for school and watched the whole thing happen. And you don't know any of the intricacies of what was going on in either one of those buildings. And you give some very, very good insight into what went on in Tower 2. And like I said, yeah. jarring stuff, to be honest. Well, thank you. I mean, it's, I learned so much writing the book. As, as, as I just hope that, like I said, what my my real goal with this book is that everyone who reads it, whether you're the second grader or the CEO, there's a lesson on every page. There's a new way of of looking at the world at the end of every chapter. And then once you have all of this insight in place at the back of the book, I provide, you know, four sections on how to conduct your own personal threat assessment for those realms where we, we live the most home, school and work and life. So after you understand what it means to be safe, I provide a a way for you to conduct your own assessment. And, you know, I give, I think like 25 or 30 questions for, for each one. And I don't only tell you the questions to ask, but I tell you why they're important mm-hmm. so that you understand the context, you understand the nuance. You can, so I, you can properly frame your own expectation about, yes, this will help me, or I don't need to worry about this because, you know, sometimes our imaginations are just like so much bigger than our real fears. But the more that we can, you know, make ourselves aware the less of the less fearful we need to be because like i said before no one fears that which they know well yeah and i hope that this book can really help to you know help everyone to master the strategies to keep themselves and their loved ones protected i think it's a great tool and uh it's one of the reasons i you know when i saw it in the upcoming uh books i got to read in the synopsis on it and i had to reach out to the publisher you're actually the first author i've had on this show and uh, I'm well, so, you. so grateful for you joining me because I, I do consider myself and, I, you know, with zero military experience, I, I'm a hunter. I'm, you know, I'm skilled with firearms. I can hit a target for sure. I don't put a thousand rounds down range a month. I'll tell you that much right now. But I always have kind of considered myself a little bit of a, of a security nerd in that I really want to know some tips and tricks on how to keep myself and my loved ones, my wife and my two corgis I, those that's my whole world right there and i just after reading this book think that i'm going to go out in public especially in a post pandemic world like we talked about that's a little bit more volatile with just a uh, a tool belt full of of things that i can use to my advantage and make sure that i keep myself safe and secondarily worry about the you know the people around me obviously not my loved ones but just the ancillary crowd second and you will right. be geared just like I'm geared now if you read The Safety Trap. So please go out and pick that up on Amazon. One question, is it available on audiobook? It is, and I did the audiobook myself. Yes, uh, so, I'm so glad to hear that. That's As yeah, an audiophile, was, you're, you've are you got a great voice, Spencer. Thank you, thank you. And a face for radio. <laughs> hey, um, man, I did eight years of radio myself. I know exactly what that's about. So, <laughs> um, No, this was, yeah, thank you so much. I did the, uh, it's uh, available in hardcover, ebook. Kindle mm-hmm. and uh, an audiobook, and I did the audiobook myself. I thought it was very important that I, I because I just think the way that it's written and the nuance, I, I really wanted that to be in my own voice. And so uh, I, I have extreme respect to my to St. Martin's Press, my publisher, for for giving that me that uh that um that chance to do so. 
Awesome. Well, that is the Man Room Podcast with Spencer Corson. I'm going to show the book one more time here on camera. The Safety Trap, a security expert's secrets for staying safe in a dangerous world. Thank you so much for taking the time, man. I will look forward hey, to the next This was great. Next Thank work. you so much. I appreciate you. Do you have any other books coming out soon? Anything else in the, in the, in the works? Oh, uh, yes. Just not sure what which one we're going to do first. Okay, well, I'll look forward to it. I'll keep you posted. I will definitely be in touch. Thank you so much. That's the Man Room Podcast, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. And, 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 and,